Welcome everybody. It's my pleasure today to introduce Samantha Moore and she'll be telling us about the generalized persist persistence diagram and how it determines the vibrated Betty numbers. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for having me today. I'm very excited. Uh, and yeah, so I will be talking about the how the generalized persistence diagram determines the bigraded Betty numbers. Uh, this was part of my dissertation work at UNC Chapel Hill, and it was done with my collaborator Wu Jin Kim from Duke University. All right, so a little overview of the talk. Uh, we're going to talk about just persistent homology at the start, uh, persistence modules and their applications a little bit. Then we'll get into a little bit more of the operations and specific types of persistence modules. Then we'll talk about the invariants that are the focus of this talk, so the generalized persistence diagram, the bigraded Betty numbers, as well as the generalized rank invariant. And then we will get into the main theorem and a visual interpretation of it. That main theorem is exactly what the title makes it sound like. Uh, it's this saying that if you have a two-parameter persistence module, then the generalized persistence diagram uh, can be used to calculate the bigraded Betty numbers using this admittedly messy formula, uh, but this messy formula is going to lead to a really nice visual interpretation, uh, which is how we'll wrap up this talk. Okay, so starting off with persistence modules and their applications. Uh, so we're going to begin with some directed acyclic graph, and then to each of the vertices, you're going to assign a vector space, and to each of the edges, you assign a linear map, so that the resulting diagram commutes. Uh, for the sake of this talk, all of my vector spaces are over R, but you can use any field. And so this resulting sort of concept is called a persistence module. And sort of the classical place where persistence modules have been used, uh, the underlying graphs have been end to the end, given sort of the typical lattice structure. So, for example, N1 is turned into a directed acyclic graph uh, by putting a point at each uh, P in N1, and then arrows going from N to N plus 1. And N2 uh, is given a lot of structure where we put a point or a vertex at each point in N2, and then arrows um, going from P to P plus 0, 1, and P plus 1, 0. Sorry, reverse. The directions I just pointed. Uh, so that is, yeah, and so forth. You can give n to the n sort of this lattice structure. Uh, and the focus of today's talk is going to be on these uh, persistence modules with the underlying graph n2. Uh, so we'll call those n2 persistence modules or two parameter persistence modules. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit briefly about applications. Um, admittedly, this is not very much at all what I do, uh, but it's also always worthy of talking about why we might care about persistence modules. Uh, so the idea is, given any data set, um, you can create a persistence module, especially data sets with metric, within metric spaces. So for example, if I start with this data set, which I'm thinking about as lying within Euclidean space with the typical Euclidean metric, um, I can create a persistence module from this in the following way. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, for each epsilon uh, in R, I'm going to think about uh, the picture that I get when I have an epsilon ball around my data set. So this is just showing as epsilon increases what some of those pictures look like. And then for each epsilon, I'm going to look at that picture and create a related simplicial complex. Uh, the thing that I'm really paying attention to is just how many balls are overlapping at a given point. So for example, uh, when epsilon is zero, I have no overlapping, so I just have a uh, zero simplex for each of the points in my data set. Uh, and for a while, that's still true that the epsilon balls will not overlap at all, so I'm still going to just have a zero simplex for each of the points in my data set. Then eventually, we start getting some overlap, so these two epsilon balls now overlap. So we represent that with a 1 simplex. Now these two balls overlap as well, so we get another 1 simplex. And now we have uh, three of them overlapping, so now we get a 2 simplex, and so forth. So for each epsilon in R, I've now got a simplicial complex. And in fact, uh, these are going to include 
uh, into each other. So this picture includes over here and so forth. It's always going to include to the right. And so with that, we can take any homology and we'll get a persistence module. Uh, so for example, I took, I think, yeah, zero as homology to get this persistence module. Basically just keeping track of the connected components and how they're mapping to each other under those inclusion maps. So what we've done so far is we took a data set, we created some sort of set of related topological spaces, and then we applied homology and we got a persistence module. Uh, and what we can do with this now is we can study the properties of the persistence module, things like the structure, its invariance, and so forth. We can pull it back, pull that information back and get some information about the shape of the topological spaces that we had built up. And then pull it back further and get information about the shape of the data itself. So this is sort of the full persistent homology pipeline. My work uh, primarily lies in this arrow, and that's what we're going to be talking about today is lying within this arrow. Uh, so looking at persistence modules and studying their invariance. All right. So that was uh, persistence modules and their applications. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about a little bit more um, vocab related to persistence modules. So the direct sum of two persistence modules M and N is going to be, again, a persistence module with the same underlying graph. Uh, and we're just going to take the direct sum sort of point-wise. So if we take this module, direct sum this module, we get this module by taking, say, so we do R, direct sum R gives us R2 here. R, direct sum R2 gives us R3 here. R3 direct sum R2 gives us R5 and so forth. So just pointwise uh, direct summing the vector spaces and similar for the maps. So for example, take the projection map, uh, direct sum the identity map in R2 and that's the map we assign here. So given two modules, we can take their direct sum and create a new persistence module. Indecomposable modules are the modules that can't be broken down any further using direct sum. So in particular, if um, your module M can be written as M1 direct sum M2, um, then you need that either M1 or M2 to be the zero module. So zero vector spaces everywhere and zero maps everywhere. Uh, if that's always true, whenever M is written as a direct sum, then we say that M is an indecomposable persistence module. And the Kronschmidt Remach theorem says that uh, any finite persistence module can be written as a direct sum of indecomposable modules, or is isomorphic to a direct sum of indecomposable modules. Uh, and since indecomposable modules can't be broken down any further with direct sum, uh, this slide really is saying that indecomposable modules are our building blocks for all persistence modules. Uh, so then connected sets, these are going to be just path connected sets in our underlying directed acyclic graph. Uh, so for example, these are all connected sets, they just have one uh, path component. And these will not be connected sets, they have multiple path compo connected components. And a connected set is said to be an interval if it's also closed under direct paths. So for example, because I have this point and this point in my interval, and I have this directed path between them, I also need this point and this point to be in my interval. So intervals are directed path, uh, closed under directed paths. So these are all intervals in the uh, directed acyclic graph structure of N2. And you might notice they all have sort of this backward staircase shape. So if you think about trying to walk up the stairs going from right to left, you can do that. Uh, and sort of the underneath has a similar structure. And so any interval in N2 is going to have that backward staircase structure. Uh, so that makes it pretty easy to identify whether or not you're looking at an interval when you're looking at N2. So once we have intervals, we can talk about interval persistence modules. So you're going to start with any interval. And then within that interval, you're going to put 
have the vector spaces being R and the linear maps being the identity map. And then outside of that interval, you're going to have zero vector spaces and zero maps. So this is an indecomposable interval persistence module. Very, very simple modules. And we say that a module is interval decomposable if it can be written as a direct sum of interval modules. So if it's indecomposable decomposition that we saw earlier from Kloschmidt Remock, if each of those sum ends is an interval module. So for example, uh, this module might not look it immediately, but this is going to be interval decomposable. You can uh, calculate the interval decomposition or the indecomposable <laughs> decomposition. Uh, you get these as the summons, and each of these is an interval module. So R is an identities in this region, R an identity in this region, and then R is an identities in this region. Uh, so this module is interval decomposable. I feel like I'm talking very fast. Uh, please feel free to put questions in the chat if you have any. Um, but otherwise, we are now moving on to invariance. Uh, so the generalized rank invariant of M, uh, I'll sort of mention the actual definition of it, which is a category theoretic idea. Um, and then I'll actually go into a equivalent sort of formula that is more how I prefer to think of it. So if this slide doesn't quite make sense to you, don't worry about that. Uh, so the generalized rank invariant, uh, you're going to give me a module M and a connected set J. And the rank of M at J, it's going to be an integer. Uh, in particular, it's the rank of the canonical limit to co-limit map of M being restricted to J. So M restricted to J, that is a module with underlying graph J. Uh, and then you can calculate the limit and the co-limit and look at the rank of that map. Again, if that is not a concept that you're super familiar with, don't worry about it. It's not how I think about it. I think about it in this way, um, that I think is a little bit more intuitive. Uh, so by a theorem by Chambers and Letcher, uh, the rank of M at J can also be calculated in this way. So we're going to start with our module M and our connected set J. And first thing we're going to do is we're going to delete the rest of M. We only care about M restricted to J. And then once we have M restricted to J, calculate the uh, indecomposable decomposition. And what I'm looking for are the copies of the interval module with full support. So I'm looking for where I have R's everywhere and identity maps between. So I can delete everything else. And the rank of M at J is going to be the number of those summons. So we had just one summon of the interval module with full support, so the rank of M on that connected set J is 1. Oh. So that is the rank invariant of M. And um, if, mm -hmm. if J prime were sort of a connected subset of J, then the rank mm -hmm. of J prime would be at least as large. Is that is that right? Yes. Yes, because of exactly this concept. Uh, if you're restricting to sort of smaller, you can possibly have more full support identity uh, or interval modules, uh, but you certainly can't have fewer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So then the generalized persistence diagram. Uh, this is also going to be a function from the set of connected sets into the set of integers. Uh, and it's going to be, in fact, the unique function such that this holds. So the rank of M on some connected set I is going to be equal to the generalized persistence diagram values of M on uh, connected sets J, which contain I. In other words, uh, if you've seen this vocabulary before, the generalized persistence diagram is the Mobius inversion of the generalized rank invariant uh, over the uh, post set, which is the connected interval or the connected sets, um, given sort of this partial ordering. Again, 
there's a nice formula, which is how I prefer to think of the generalized persistence diagram. Uh, so equivalent to that, um, by a theorem by Kim and Mamoli, we can calculate the generalized persistence diagram as follows. Uh, so the diagram value of m on a connected set J is going to be an alternating sum of rank values of m on connected sets I, which are sort of nearby. I think this is clearest in an example what that formula really is saying. So for example, what that formula says for this uh, calculation, if I wanted to calculate the diagram of M on this connected set, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the neighboring points to that connected set. So I have just three neighboring points to this connected set. And then I'm going to do my alternating sum based on how many of those neighboring points I add in. So first I'm going to do the rank of M just on that original set, not adding in any of the connected points and uh, any of the neighboring points. And so I'm going to have a positive sign. Then I'm going to start adding in one of the neighboring points at a time and I'm going to switch my sign. So I'll subtract off the rank of M on the connected set union this one neighboring point, connected set union this one neighboring point, and the rank of M on this connected set union this neighboring point. Now I've run out of singletons to add in, so I'll add in two points at a time uh, and again switch my sign. So now I'm adding the rank value of M on the original set union these two neighbors, original, adding the rank of M on the original set union these two neighbors, and adding the rank of M on the original set union these two neighbors. Then I ran out of pairs of neighbors, so now I'll add in all three of the neighboring points and again switch my sign. So I'll subtract off the rank of M on the original set union, these three neighbors. So in general, the diagram value of M, you're going to hand me a connected set. And it's just going to be an alternating sum of rank values on sort of nearby connected sets. Uh, so you may be asking, why would we care about the generalized persistence diagram? That last slide uh, looks computationally difficult. It is. Um, you would be correct. Uh, and so I, there are various reasons. Um, one, this invariant is uh, close to uh, several invariants that have been studied by different people. Um, lots of slightly different Mobius inversions have been studied. Um, I think off the top of my head, I'm thinking of uh, Patel has a similar one and uh, Bouchain Escalar and so forth. Uh, and then also the generalized persistence diagram has a lot of sort of very nice properties that make us think that if we can figure out how to compute it quickly, it would definitely be a helpful invariant. So for example, one of those nice properties, uh, my favorite nice property, uh, is a theorem by Kim and Mamoli, uh, which says that if your module M is interval decomposable, so it's a direct sum of interval modules, then you can read off the diagram values very easily. So back to our favorite example, because we've seen it three times now, of an interval decomposable module. Uh, so this module breaks down into, again, these sort of five interval summons. And just from seeing this interval decomposition, I can tell you what the diagram values are. So the diagram value of M on the full, uh, full graph is going to be one because I have one interval uh, summoned that has support equal to the full graph. The diagram value of M at just this point is going to be one because again, I have an interval uh, with that support. And the diagram value of M on this connected set is going to be three because I have three summons that are that interval. So for interval decomposable modules, I can very quickly see the diagram values. And in fact, the diagram value on any other connected set is going to be zero. Uh, so I can fully see the diagram values. And this is only true for interval decomposable modules. Uh, for sort of more complicated modules, the diagram value is also going to be more complicated. Um, yeah, so the diagram values of an interval decomposable module just sort of tells us what our intervals are. In other words, the generalized persistence diagram is going to be a generalization of the notion of a barcode or an interval decomposition, uh, which is nice because when we're looking at n2 modules and n to the n modules, uh, 
our modules are no longer necessarily have a nice barcode. So it's definitely good to have generalizations that can still be helpful. So that is our second uh, invariant. And then our third invariant is going to be the bi-graded Betty numbers. For the commutative algebraists in the room, yes, this is the free modules idea. Uh, but as you may have learned from the last two uh, invariants, I prefer to think of things in sort of maybe not their definition, but I guess the uh, intuitive, something that gives me a little bit of information. So I'm going to define the bigraded Betty numbers a little bit differently. Uh, so first idea, if you hand me a module and I'm trying to find its bigraded Betty numbers, uh, first I'm going to find a minimal generating set for that module. So uh, for example, I'll take a non-zero vector out of this copy of R and a non-zero vector out of this copy of R. And those two vectors will generate the full module. If I think about all the multiples of B, I get this full copy of R. Then I apply the identity map, I get this full copy of R. All the multiples of W will give me this, so I've got the full module. And then once we have our generating set, uh, we can talk about relations that are given by that set. So things where some linear combination of those generators is mapping to zero. So for example, if I go from here to here, then v maps to zero, of course. So we say that we have a relation here of v mapping to zero. If I go from here to here, w maps to zero. So I have a relation here that w map to zero. And v and w are both going to map to the basis vector of this copy of r. Uh, so we say that v minus w is mapping to zero at this point. And so that's going to be all of the relations for this particular module. And then we can also talk about relations between relations. So again, this was v mapping to zero, this is w mapping to zero, and this is v minus w mapping to zero. In other words, this relation minus this relation is the same as this relation. As soon as we sort of have all of them together, which this will be the first place that we see all of them. So we get a relation between relations here, which is that the green relation minus the orange one equals the blue one. So for any N2 module, you can play this game, find the generators, the relations, and the relations between relations. And the bi-graded Betty numbers is basically just going to count where those things are occurring and how many of them are occurring. So uh, if we have an N2 module M uh, and some point P in N2, the zeroth bi-graded Betty number of M at P is just telling you how many generators you have of M at P. The first bi-graded Betty number of M at P is the number of relations of M at P. And then the second Betty number of M at P is the number of relations between relations of M at P. So a question here, do you want sort yes. of a, a minimal um, resolution? Yes, sorry, I said that out loud. You definitely need to start with a minimal generating set. Yes. I see. But then any minimal generating, um, any minimal any minimal way of doing it gives the same numbers. Yes, yep. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, so for example, um, oh, keep clicking too many times. Uh, so in this example, uh, the zeroth bi-graded Betty numbers are gonna be one here and here, because we have one generator at each of these points. And the zeroth bi-graded Betty numbers will be zero everywhere else because there are no other generators. The first bi-graded Betty numbers are going to be one here at this point, at this point, and this point. Because again, we have relations at each of those points, just one relation at each point. Uh, and these first bi-graded Betty numbers will be zero elsewhere because there are no other relations. And then because we have one relation between relations here, the second bi-graded Betty number of M at 2, 2 will be one. And no other relations between relations, so all other second bi-graded Betty numbers will be zero. So it's just counting where our uh, generators, relations, and relations between relations are occurring, as well as how many are occurring at that given point. Uh, so bi-graded Betty numbers actually have a pretty nice visual interpretation uh, if your module is interval decomposable. Uh, and so this will relate to that visual interpretation that I'll talk about later with our main theorem. So I wanted to talk about this for a minute. Uh, so we're going to start with an interval decomposable two-parameter module M. Uh, so for example, this module. Uh, and the first thing that we're going to do 
is just sort of go back to think about the underlying intervals. And that each of those underlying intervals, we're going to extend. So this is an interval in N2. We're going to extend it to an interval in R2 uh, by replacing each point P in my interval. So this point P. So each point P you're going to replace by the uh, sort of square from P to P plus one one. Uh, and you're going to have closed lower boundaries and open upper boundaries. So this point P gets extended to this square with closed lower boundaries and open upper boundaries. So now I have an interval in R2. In that interval in R2, uh, we can look at each of the corners and classify them. So for example, this is going to be a zeroth type uh, corner because first of all, my module sort of lies above it and I have closed boundaries. So this point and this point are both going to be zeroth type uh, corners. And then this corner, this corner, this corner, and this corner, these are all gonna be first type uh, corners. So for example, this one looks like this picture, so it's a first type. And then these two corners are going to be second type corners. So every corner in your interval is going to have an associated type. And the Betty numbers are very, very easy to read once you have that picture sorted out and you've assigned your corner types. Uh, so the Jace Betty grade Betty graded, Jace bigraded Betty number of M at P is going to be equal to the number of type J corner points that you have when you've extended each of your intervals in this way at P. So for example, um, we started with an interval module that led to this sort of extended interval. Uh, and so for that module, because at two zero, we have a type one Sorry, nope, that should say type zero. We have a type zero corner point, so the zeroth Betty graded number of M at two zero will be one because we have a zero type corner point. So that, yeah, this should be zero here. And so forth. So very quick to read once you've assigned your corner types. Uh, it's very quick to read off the bi-graded Betty numbers. You're just looking at how many of each type of corner point you have. So a summary of the invariants we've talked about, because I just threw a lot of vocab at you. Uh, so the rank invariant of M, you're going to give me a connected set J. And I'm going to delete everything else, look at the indecomposable decomposition, and count how many full support interval modules I have. So you give me a connected set, and I'm going to hand you back uh, an integer. Generalized persistence diagram, same thing. You're going to hand me a connected set, and I'm going to give you back an integer. Uh, and the way that I do that is going to be an alternating sum of rank values of M on nearby connected sets. And then our bi-graded Betty numbers, these count, so the zero ones count the number of generators, first ones count the number of relations, and second ones count the number of relations between relations. And with that, we can get to our main theorem and the interpretation of it. So main theorem, uh, this is again, uh, joint work with Wu Jin Kim. Uh, but what we found is this formula for calculating the bi-graded Betty numbers from the generalized persistence diagram. Again, this is a bit of a messy formula, I will fully admit. Uh, and, and this will not be computationally very quick, um, but there are sort of two reasons why we do like this result. First, um, I think it just gives us more motivation for why we should be looking at the generalized persistence diagram and trying to compute it quickly, uh, because here is yet another invariant that we care about that the generalized persistence diagram can recover. And second, this formula, uh, as complicated as it is, it actually leads to a really nice visual interpretation, which is as follows. Uh, so we're going to do a very similar thing to what we did earlier with the intervals and the bi-graded Betty numbers. Uh, so I'm going to start with any connected set, and I'm going to extend it exactly how we did before. 
So each point P extends to that square with open boundaries and closed lower boundaries. And now we have, again, we're going to assign corner types to each uh, corner. We have more things that qualify as a first type corner, uh, in particular because we started with a connected set this time and not just an interval, we might have some more complicated pictures. Um, but yeah, so every corner in our extended connected set now has an associated type. And we can use this to read off the bigraded Betty numbers from the diagram values. So the J uh, Betty number of M at P is going to be the sum of diagram values of M on uh, sets I, connected sets I, such that P is a type J corner point of the extended interval that comes from I. So again, by graded Betty number, it's just going to be a sum of diagram values, and you only add up the diagram values where P is a type J corner point of the extended interval. So once we know the diagram values and we've looked at our pictures, we can very quickly read off the by graded Betty numbers. In particular, for example, let's look at this. Let's say we have a uh, module M, and these are the extended intervals or the extended connected sets coming from uh, the diagram. So in particular, the diagram of M on, let's see, it would be this connected set will be one. Uh, so the blue ones, the diagram values are gonna be one, the red one is gonna be negative for that set. So we had diagram value of M on this connected set was one, we extend it to this interval. Diagram value of M on this connected set is one, we extend it to this connected set for the R2 version. Diagram value of M on this connected set is one, extend it to this connected set. And the diagram value on this connected set is negative one, we've extended to this connected set. So this is sort of the diagram value and the extended intervals all written down in one. So again, if we look at our formula, uh, we can now really quickly read off the bigraded Betty numbers of our module. Um, so, for example, the second bigraded Betty number of M at 3, 0. So we're going to look at 3, 0, and we're looking for type 2. Nope, type 1 corner points. My goodness. Okay, sorry. We're looking for type 1 corner points, so first bigraded Betty number. Uh, so type 1 corner points are notated with stars. So at 3, 0, I'm going to have 1 type one from this, so I add in the diagram value on this connected set, which was one. I have a type one at three zero from here, so I add in the diagram value from this set, which was one. And then I have a type one uh, corner point in this extended interval, so I add in the diagram value here, which was negative one. So all in all, the first bigraded Betty number of M at 3, 0 is going to be just 1. Similarly, if I wanted let's see, 0, 2, did I manage to say the correct one? Yes, so the first bigraded Betty number of M at 0, 2, again, I'm going to look for type 1 corner points at 0, 2. So I have a type 1 from uh, this extended interval. So I'll add in the diagram value from here, which was one. And then I won't have any other type one corner points at zero two. Uh, so I don't add anything else in. So the bigraded Betty number of my module M at zero two will just be one and so forth. Uh, so very quick to read once you have your extended intervals and your diagram values. Okay, and with that, just about on time other than the coffee, uh, but here are my citations, uh, and thank you all for listening. Thanks so much. So before we get to questions, let's uh, briefly unmute ourselves and apply. <laughs> questions for Samantha? Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe I missed something, but does any of this go through for non-interval decomposable modules. Oh, goodness. Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, I meant to make that clear. So uh, 
Let's see if I can only go back enough. So this theorem uh, actually holds for all N2 persistence modules. And so this visual interpretation that was resulting will also hold for all N2 persistence modules, not just interval modules. So yeah, our main result is for any, uh, I guess, finite N2 persistence module. But yes, much more broad than just interval decomposable. Thank you. Can I go over how I decide between dashed and solid line in the visual? Yes. So uh, when we extend, the idea is just basically you want your upper boundaries to be open and your lower boundaries to be closed. Um, yes. And I think at these two corner points, it's going to be open. Um, but yeah, once you've extended, you just want the top boundaries to be open and the bottom ones to be closed. Yeah, no worries. I wanted to ask a similar question to Steve's question. So um, mm -hmm. once you got to the main theorem, you sort of, um, as you just said, you didn't really need the interval decompo decomposable assumption, but you you use this assumption at certain parts of the talk to mm -hmm. explain more um, interpretable or easy to describe uh, descriptions of, of some of the invariants. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so I guess um, one sort of difference between the two visual interpretations that I talked about yeah. is the first visual interpretation is just for interval decomposable modules. You can read off the bigraded Betty numbers pretty quickly. And then that second interpretation says for any N2 persistence module, once you have computed the diagram values, then you can visually read off the bigraded Betty numbers. Um, so it's a, a much more sort of general visualization. I see. I, I had another question. So um, I must have blanked out and sort of missed your description of the extended extended um, interval. So you just you just extend up and to the right. Yeah. Yes. I see. So each point p, you just extend to sort of the square from p to p plus one one, uh, and you're gonna have closed lower boundaries and open upper boundaries when you do that extension. Oh, oh, okay. So it's just this. This is the picture of what you mean by the extension. Yes. Yeah. I this see. is all I mean. Go I from see. the N2 module to the extended slightly up into the right uh, R2 interval right. or connected set. Yeah. To give you know the closed lower boundary and mostly open upper boundaries. You just got. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This extension isn't. I mean, I guess quite entirely necessary. Uh, you could define your types of corner points using this. Um, but the extension just makes it a little bit clearer and nicer to draw the corner types. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I really like the visual interpretation. Yes. <laughs> so do we, uh, especially after we were staring down this formula going, hmm. <laughs> so, yes. Further questions? Well, if not, let's end at least the recorded portion here. So thanks so much, Samantha, for a fantastic talk. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>